Hello again, folks, and welcome back to the final show in Tragedies and Disasters Week, which actually has provoked some really interesting conversations on the sidebars, and I've had some really nice emails from people, and a couple of wacky emails from people saying I talk too much, but what do you expect on a show that's about talking? But there you go. Um, it's, I was just saying to our guest, it's weird in a sense, when I planned this week, we've the scale of the tragedies has kind of reduced in scale as the week's going has gone on from the... The, the massive great tragedy in Manila on the first day, down, down, down. But in some ways, I think that's good because it, it cranks up the emotional response because, as we always talk about on this channel, when you're talking about the, the numbers, the sheer numbers of people killed in World War II, and it's the millions, tens of millions, it all just becomes numbers. When You, know, you, can, you can list X number of air crew, X number of prisoners, X number of this were killed. It's just figures. What makes it interest is, uh, interesting is the human aspect that who were these people and that's what we're going to do tonight we're going to discuss that very subject so uh, my guest today he's a journalist has written quite a lot about military history but done different eras talked about slavery talked about the 60s ships disasters um i mean i'm delighted to have him so um good day gregory how are you doing great thank you for having me so Gregory Freeman, a historian, as I said, a journalist, um, how did you discover this particular story? Because it's, it, you know, you're in America, this is in Germany. Where, where did you discover it? This one, um, like a lot of the, the books I write, the, this topic I just kind of stumbled upon because um, probably like yourself and a lot of your viewers, I'm just always digging into uh, World War II stories, uh, other eras, and trying to find something that I hadn't heard about before, something that I uh, that I thought uh, was an interesting story and, and should be told, but hadn't been. And I came across a, a brief mention of the trial, um, just because it was the first uh, war crimes trial prosecuted after World War II, and started looking into it. I was wondering, um, how did that become the first trial? And uh, the more I looked into it, the, the more interesting the story got. And and as you were alluding to already, uh, there's such a personal element to it. Uh, the the individuals involved here, um, I, I think, like you were saying, they they really illustrate how uh, no matter no matter how big a war is, it it all comes down to individual stories. And this is a pretty good example of that, I think. Yeah, and it's been a recurring theme on World War II TV about how things changed in terms of what happened to people found behind the lines. So commando spies, air crew, post Hitler's infamous commando order. And we've talked about that a lot and how your chances of, of, of survival changed as the war went on. And it also changed depending on where you were when you found yourselves on the wrong side of, of enemy lines, so to speak. And and this is, this is a period where right in the middle of strategic bombing, which we've talked about a lot, but we're not actually, of course, talking about the role of strategic bombing today. We're just talking about what happened on one particular mission, but we've got illustrations of that. So we'll start at the very beginning. So we're talking about 1944. So this is kind of midway through the 8th Air Force in its bombing of Germany. Uh, B-24s, B-17, this is a B-24 crew. Um, and um, the, this is the aircraft. So that, that hence the, the unusual name for the show and the unusual name for your for your book in that so many of these aircraft had the the, the nose art and it was pinups it was cartoon characters it was references to the cities the the crews came from so tell us a little bit about about the aircraft first then we'll move on to the people yeah b24 uh you know pretty pretty common in the eighth air force in that campaign uh nine man crew and um, the mission they went out on that day was uh, um, fairly routine, um, but uh, they got shot down and um, were um, eventually, uh, well, pretty soon captured. And uh, they were being transported. And well, uh, let, let, let's, we're, we're, I think we're getting, well, let's, let's, let's slow it down a bit, if you don't mind, Gregory, and kind of build the story up a little bit so that we get a bit of tension there. So, um, the, the, I think I want to get across to people is within the 8th Air Force, We, I think people, the viewers have, sometimes have an idea of one aircraft, one crew all the time. It's not the situation, is it? Aircraft are, are taken in out of service as they have engine repairs. Crews go off on special training. They get Sometimes they're ill. You know, the Memphis Bell, I think, both versions of the film give us this idea that there's always this clique of men who stay together and they stay together with the aircraft. And actually, the reality 
is, is not the case there. So in this particular photo, which is the one that is always used to discover this photo, there were two men in that photo who didn't actually take this mission. Yeah, you know, they, they were they were off. It was the it was the uh, navigator and the bombardier. So Cassidy and Robinson were off on a course to update their training. So so right. sometimes it's a ten man crew in the B twenty four. Sometimes it's a nine man crew. It depends on what the mission. And as you say, this one wasn't. It's kind of average in how dangerous they were. When we talk about the 8th Air Force, we talk about the terrible ones, the Schweinfurt and ball bearing factories and big week earlier in the war. And then there's other runs we call them, they call the milk runs, when it was just perhaps not so in, going into Germany so far. This is kind of average on the scale. It's Hanover, uh, which was the um, uh, industrial city and, and, and large target. So, um, uh, when, just before we get into the story again, how, how did you uh, set about adding to the information that was ready available? You said you you found about the court first, but how difficult is it is it acquiring all the the histories of Eighth Air Force personnel? Uh, pretty pretty difficult and getting more difficult every day. Um, uh, when I set off on a story like this, uh, my first goal is always to find either the living vets or their close relatives uh, to talk to because no matter um, what wealth of information you can get from documents and uh, you know rec recorded history about uh, events and, and things there is nothing like talking to the person who was there and second to that is talking to that person's close surviving relatives who hopefully have heard that story firsthand from these folks and so uh, that's what I did in this case. Um, and I was able to get in touch with the family of Rogers, the pilot. And um, his uh, daughter had uh, kept the story alive very much in the family. Um, his widow was still alive. Um, I was able to speak with her. And uh, they were really helpful in um, getting me a better feel for who these people were not just Rogers, but the friends that he had on the crew that he, uh, that the family stayed in touch with, uh, the surviving members of the crew that they survived, stayed in touch with long after the war. And uh, so getting to know them and getting a, a more, a warmer, more full picture of who these people were, uh, was a key part of the research. And, and I think that's important because so often, as I said, I kind of hinted at earlier on is, when we talk about the bombing campaign, it's often about numbers. We talk about how many aircraft went into the air and how many tons of bombs they dropped and how right. the resulting impact was or wasn't on whatever it was at the target. But the fact is, these are these are little families. I know, as I just said, the family that members sometimes change because of illness and going off on training, but they're still in the air, this, this little team of people. We've talked about it in Strategic Bombing Week who are dependent on each other. That's the thing. They they in effect they 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 live together they serve together and if necessary they will die together and unfortunately right. so often what happens with an aircraft if it gets hit in the air everybody t dies i mean it's it, it can be really tragic so it's important to understand and bring it down to this level of of a being an individual crew and i know obviously people realize that there's going to be a bad ending to this story and we've we've, we've, we've hinted at that already but in researching that and you do you have tackled subjects where there are i guess sad endings does that mean you have to tread even more sensitively when you're talking to family members because uh, you know in my experience dealing with canadian veterans and families in normandy if you know that your father your grandfather died storming juno beach that's one thing if you found out he was murdered by the ss it's a bit different. It doesn't, you know, the outcome is the same. You've still lost a relative in the war, but the reaction to it, the uh, the emotional response to it is is very different. So it, it must have meant you had to kind of approach these people with kid gloves because in order to tell the story, you've got to go into some detail as well. And detail in this situation, as we will find out later, the detail gets rather, rather nasty and rather graphic. So did, did yeah. you find the process difficult in that regard? Yes, um, with this book and, and all of my other books, that is very much the case. Um, when you're writing about these kind of stories, you're, you're, you're talking about what is probably the most uh, tragic and influential event in somebody's life, um, uh, if you're talking to the survivors. And 
uh, if you're talking to their family members, uh, you're talking about a, a very tragic uh, uh, memory of their loved one. And you have you do have to approach that very delicately um, because, uh, you know, in my case, I am approaching them as a complete stranger coming to them out of the blue and basically saying, will you tell me all the intimate tragic details of this sad part of your life or your family's life. Um, and that's a big ask. Um, and you don't just storm into somebody's life and, and uh, expect them to, to give you that. Um, so it, yeah, you have to take a very delicate approach to it. And um, if, you know, if you can gain their trust, then I, I take that very, very seriously. Um, and I feel a, a, a huge sense of obligation to do right by them with that story, to, to tell their story, um, not just accurately in terms of the facts, but to tell it uh, respectfully and uh, to sort of convey the, the, the larger part of the story rather than just the simple facts. And a lot of times, yeah, you're getting into some, some really ugly details that have to be included in the story. And in this case, um, the families had already seen, you know, the autopsy reports and the photos and everything and, and read the trial transcripts and stuff. And so they were familiar with it. Um, you know, I wasn't coming to them and revealing anything new to them in that regard. Um, but still talking to them about it is different. Um, they, they, they know about it, but but talking to them about it is is still a very delicate thing. And some other books um, I have I've been involved in that kind of research and I I did uncover information that family members didn't know. And um, in some cases, you know, just very sad kind of gruesome details that they didn't know. And in, in some cases, I elected not to include it in, in the book because it wasn't crucial to the story and I wasn't going to add that to their memory of their loved one. So uh, sometimes you do have to make that decision to, yeah. to just keep that to yourself sometimes. No, I've been there and done that. So before, yeah, let, let's, let, there's, there's the nine men who went out on this mission. So we're talking August 24th, 1944. So give a, a, a like a one sentence bio you know the, you know the beginning of memphis bell when the, when it, the, the eric stoltz does a little description of all the men in the aircraft imagine you're eric stoltz giving a breakdown of the nine men just so that my, the viewers get an idea of who we're talking about and where these men came from oh i don't know if i can really do that it's been a while since okay so just well they, they represent different corners of the usa yeah. di you know, different nationalities but they're they, you know the, the, and rogers is the pilot so he's the He's the boss of the of the team, so to speak. But you know, what strikes you about? Give us something notable that you would think about one of them or, or Rogers themselves that you you would have discovered about maybe his leadership style or what this crew were they were did, were they uh, were they happy go lucky? Did they believe in superstition? Well, there must be something that you kind of unearthed that set them yeah, apart. They were all. I mean, they they did all strike me as you know. Look at their ages. They're you know like nineteen twenty four. Brandon Stuhl was old at 28 and they were all young men and yeah, they were, they were in a bomber, they were fighting a war, but they were still 24, 19 year old men with the personalities of men that age that, that we know today, you know, they're, they're young, they're, they're, they're not especially brave, but they're not especially scared either. And they, they did take their job seriously. Um, Rogers, in particular, all the way through this experience, um, after they were shot down and and through the end of what they experienced, he was he was their leader. He was to the end trying to uh, lead his men and protect his men, and um, that was very much a big part of his personality. And you um, make a good point, I think, Gregory. Is that you know. I, I, 19 years old you have your personality hasn't developed yet they're they're part no. of a machine they're uh, they haven't had time i mean that that the the weird life of the eighth air force we've talked about it before is it's either intense terrifying combat or kicking your heels on a base in this case in the middle of rural norfolk we've done shows about uh, other bases in norfolk again which is two counties up from where i'm from you know how it was like a world apart from so if you were coming from chicago or 
or New York or something. Rural Norfolk was was a very, very odd place to be with its warm beer and cricket on a Sunday afternoon and what have you. And so they go in from this strange, all all intense, scare, scary combat back to sitting in a in a on a base again, waiting for the weather to clear for the next operation. And you know, as we know, some of some of these men would, would do dozens of missions, some would get killed on their first one. That that lottery effect of you join a crew, you join right. a squadron, and everybody knowing that the math is against you you know your your chance of getting through whatever the number of missions is that's been set at that time of the war your chance of getting through that whether it's 15 or 20 or 25 the math is against you so they all have that 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 expectation of of non-survival in a sense so and i think that's that you that's you know the the a, a contributing factor is that because of that high risk they don't allow themselves to think about the future very much. You don't find people of that in that yeah. area talking about what they're going to do after the war because, you know, they they, they want to get through Thursday first. They want to get through the right. next flight. So a, a long way ahead for them is is their next birthday, perhaps. I'm not thinking a long time ahead, but so we'll get back to the mission. So the mission takes off, and it's 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 a it's a medium sized one. So 700, 800 bombers. And there's the usual 8th Air Force doing diversionary raids elsewhere to take the Luftwaffe away. But this is an incredible photo because this is showing um, Bam Bam there on the left there. That is the aircraft with the number one engine on fire. So what do we think happened and where did it happen as it's flying in towards Germany? I don't recall exactly where it happened. You may recall the details better than I do at this point. Um, but um, yeah, they, they went down. Uh, before their target. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I, I, the, from what I've read, they, they weren't even sure where it was when they were hit because that's typical of what's going on when you're under the flat like that. Um, especially when in this case, the navigator, I'll go back to the crew photo again, the, the, the navigator bombardier, and I can't, I've, I can't pronounce his name. I don't know if you can help me out with that one there, but. The Fugin, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's just joined the crew because the two other guys, Cassidy and the other fellow have gone off for training. So he's, he's brand, he doesn't know anybody. And he's doing two jobs that day. He's doing navigator and bombardier, presumably because there's a master bombardier in another aircraft who they're just kind of following too. So it completely makes sense that the survivors of this didn't actually know where they were when they were when they were hit, because it's in this stage case you're you're playing follow the leader, really, in that formation. So but yes, yeah, some miles away from the target. But that that photo there is remarkable, actually showing the engine on fire. That seems to yeah. be you know, the flames and smoke coming out of it there. Yeah, it's incredible. So and they, they, it, it, well, I'll, I'll let you take over. So it's hit. Uh, a couple of them are wounded in the aircraft by the flak, aren't they? Right, right. A couple are wounded before they go down. Uh, once they go down, they are uh, captured uh, pretty quickly. Um, one of the crew, Brennan Stuhl, um, is sent away for medical treatment. So he's separated from the rest of the surviving crew. And the others are taken into custody. The uh, the authorities want to take them to um, I forget what city they were trying to take them to, but to a larger locale uh, to be interrogated, and they put them on a train. Um, the train ran into a section of track uh, that had been destroyed by the bombing, so they had to take the men off and walk them on foot around the damaged track to the next uh, station where they could take a train and continue, and that's where things went wrong. They had the crew on foot. This is Russelheim, isn't it? Which is right. Which which is a long. I'll, I'll show. I'll bring the map up in a second, so we people get an idea where we are. So here's here's a map I made. So there, there's where they took off from in Norfolk and England. The target is Hanover. They crash somewhere on the way there, and then they're taken by train off to. I forget. And I'm like you. Yeah, I forget where they're being taken to, but they end up having to disembark in Russelheim. Now, coincidentally, Russelheim had been the victim the day before of a raid by the RAF, night bombing raid, of the Opal factory uh, for vehicles. And there'd been lots and lots of damage to the town there, uh, but not but not by these Americans, by by another force of flyers. But they, th this this was like the morning after this very, very tragic, well, not tragic from the, from the Allied point of view, but tragic from the local point of view, because they'd seen lots of people killed. Strategic target, big, important factory, but in heavily hit. And that is a post-bombing post raid for, uh, photo of the factory, the Opal factory in, in uh, Russellheim. So I'll hand it back to you to carry on the story. And this was at a point in the war when the German populace was 
uh, really becoming tired of, of, of the bombing. Um, you know, there was they were developing this great animosity toward the Allied bombers. And um, so when these American, uh, this American bomber crew was walked through Ruschelheim, uh, the citizens came out and were just, they, they were angry already. And they thought this was a crew member from the previous night's bombing. And um, so basically a, a crowd started following the, the men as they were being led through the city. And that crowd soon turned violent and attacked them. And the, the authorities who were leading the men through made a half-hearted attempt to, to keep them moving and keep them uh, uh, moving away from the crowd. But the mob grew quickly, grew very violent. And it was made, this mob was made up of just the most ordinary people you could imagine. Um, you know, th this was young people, old people, men, women, um, a pair of sisters, um, elderly women. Um, and this, this mob violently, very viciously started attacking the crewmen. Um, the crew, the air crew got separated um, into two groups um, and were pursued by two mobs, eventually came back together. And in the end, this went on, mind you, for about two hours. Um, and this, in the end, they were trapped up against a, a brick wall where some of the most vicious attacks happened and where all of the men, most of the men succumbed to, to the beatings. And when it appeared that they were dead, um, a local warden, uh, Hartgen, uh, he was kind of a, kind of a showboat type. Uh, he made a big show of telling everyone he was going to put them out of their misery. And he had them, had the airmen's bodies, their lifeless or seemingly lifeless bodies, uh, lined up on the sidewalk there. And then he went down the row and started shooting them in the head. Um, he ran out of ammunition after four shots, but assumed that the rest were dead. Um, after that, uh, the he ordered the uh, um, local Hitler youth to put the bodies in a cart and take them to the cemetery. Uh, that was they were taken away, and part of the crowd followed them to the cemetery in a sort of celebratory mood. And when they got to the cemetery, uh, bodies were eventually buried in a mass grave. Um, what I'm just interrupt you for a second now. Does that tell people what we've been showing on the screen? So the, these are stills from the investigation. This is the the post event investigation of this of this road. It's still there. It's still in the city. There's a, a parking lot. They will show you photos of the site as it is today later on. And I, I want to jump in now, Greg, because I think what's been so fascinating in this week and how we've got to this point is a recurring theme has been the premeditated nature of some of the atrocities we've dealt with in Manila, in the Philippines, you know, the Japanese are giving orders that anybody found on the street is a legitimate target. Hence you start this escalation of, of violence. Uh, we talked about Lidice in, in, in Czechoslovakia, where it's a response. It's a reprisal to the assassination of Heydrich. And there's a, there's a masterminded plan at a high level with SS officials of high rank going out and, and doing these awful deeds in this case, and I think that, and I'll, we'll get to the, the trial and why it became the first trial, you know, one well, of the first war crime trials. It is just ordinary people. There is no higher order. Hitler isn't seeing this and rubber stamping some kind of order. It is just a spontaneous outburst of anger by completely ordinary people. Um, and this air raid warden guy, uh, there's, we, we did another one, another show a few weeks ago with Sean um, uh, Feast from England about an, air, an RAF air crew shot down. And, the, and again, the guy responsible was a very petty bureaucrat. He was somebody who was nobody before the war, and the war gave him a little bit of authority. Just that sort of 
we call it a jobs jobs worth in, in in England that you know the kind of parking attendant who makes your life difficult because you haven't got the right part stamp on your parking permit kind of thing right. that kind of guy and that's fascinating that and so uh, you know we'll, we'll carry on with the story in a minute but Greg when you're when you were searching this Gregory the what was your reaction about I mean yes we can understand there's a there's an anger about the bombing raid but the psychology of people, old ladies getting angry. What, what's, your, what's your kind of gut feeling about the, the real reason for this? Is it just bad luck? Is it timing? Is it? That is part of the fascination of this story. Um, and, and we'll see that later on the, the authorities thought so too. But um, it's, you're right. It, it, it is fascinating in the, in the way that there was, there was, not even uh, there was no one like like rousing the the public to do this there were not even not even the local officials not even this petty air raid warden um they weren't egging people on to come and do this because you know this is what hitler would want it was just a completely spontaneous expression of their their anger and their frustration and you know i guess the you know the the result of their own terror um from being bombed so much um it was um it was not provoked in any way it was not officially encouraged in any way and so that does make you wonder what is it about the mentality of these people that they could do this because they were particularly vicious about it um some of the testimony later on revealed that uh, you know they were they were taking great satisfaction in what they were doing to these airmen. Um, you know, there's a, there's a one anecdote in the book about how this this one guy with this one older gentleman, um, as the mob is following the airmen along and they've been beating them and all, he stops to chat at the garden fence with this woman he knows and says, oh, you know, my hands are so tired from beating these guys, you know, and he's like very jocular about it. And it it makes you wonder about what was wrong with the mentality of this this group of citizenry uh, because it doesn't it doesn't seem like something you would expect from just ordinary people and that's what they were they were just ordinary people. It's that it's that thing when you when when the news breaks about some new serial killer somewhere, I think all of us as human beings want that person to be an absolute evil sadistic nut job so we can just we can rationalize it we right. want we want that evil and when it turns out to be someone really really boring and really really ordinary who people around them are, well i didn't he was just you know he she was just the the normal person they buy their newspaper before we work because these are people who presumably were just going through the wall like everybody else is living with rationing they're going and getting their food they're looking uh, of course, that bombing raid had happened the night before. I think that is obviously key. I, you know, my some of my family was in London during the Blitz, and I and I I would imagine that if sometimes a Luftwaffe bomber pilot happened to walk down the street the very next morning after something, maybe they would respond in the same way. But luckily, maybe whatever those situations didn't happen very often, where a potential cause of sorrow was right there in your face but um it, it is it is it is interesting into the human uh, psyche and i think that's why this show is because it, it goes as i say goes against the trend of what we've been doing this week of this organized evil there's something more awful about ordinary people doing something so vicious but now yeah. two, two of the guys who were beaten badly didn't actually die did they and they they managed to escape and they ended up um going into so the, the the first one was in the hospital he he must that and that was um brennan still yeah brennan still so he he ends up getting a pre pow cap and he 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 mercifully being wounded in the aircraft and being treated immediately saved his life and then two others actually crawl away from this and i can't i can't even picture what that scene would have been like of these these they were assumed to be dead and they were they were in the heap of bodies in the cart taken to the cemetery um, and before they could be buried, you know, they had left the cart alone that night and they, they managed to escape. They were very, very badly injured. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was the bit when I read the book that, that 
the fact they were actually mistaken for being dead. I mean, if that doesn't give across how how awful they must have been, how what their conditions were, and also just for those two guys to lie there for how many hours it was with your dead friend in a cart, yeah, having experienced all that. And again, this this is you know we said at the top of the show they're taking a massive great raid of hundreds of bombers and bringing it down to the experiences of a few hours of a few terrified teenage boys and what was just going on, this, this harrowing event there. So they escape and mercy. But again, they end up getting captured by other people and, 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 and treated well, bizarrely, in that, yeah. in that paradox of uh, these two guys who had who just experienced the very worst savagery of, the, of, of, a, of a small people, of, a small sample of the German people, are then treated better by other members of the German nation it must have been a very conflicting and awfully confusing situation for these two guys um and, yeah. and what range, range of emotions experience they've been through in a very short space of time i mean it, it, I'm, I'm gonna, i'll let you talk but going from flying a mission being shot at to uh, to being shot down cr- you know parachuting out crash landing blah blah, blah aircraft crashing captured in, uh, taken for interrogation, then being beaten up, being seen for dead, and then escaping and then being captured, all in a matter of really hours. I mean, it's an yeah. extraordinary experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't imagine someone that young having to deal with that range of experiences in, in such a short time. And one of them, I forget if it was Adams or Brown, realized later that he probably survived because he had been carrying one of his buddies um, through the the mob, uh, his buddy, one of the airmen had collapsed and he was carrying him on his shoulders. And that coincidentally kind of shielded him from a lot of the mob's blows. And so he felt some some weird remorse and regret about that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like you said, to see that the that other German people could actually be kind to the airmen who they, they encountered. So it was a, it was the whole story is a paradox of what human beings can be. Um, yeah. Like like you were alluding to earlier, I, I think we don't like we don't like the idea that just everyday people can become vicious and and, and brutal. Um, but uh, apparently, some of us can. Um, yeah. And in this case, it was it was the very unfortunate uh, circumstance of of these people of these airmen being brought before these people who had just been bombed. And I, I can only imagine, you know, the, the, if you had just survived the terror of a nighttime bombing and then you see what you see these airmen and it feels like it's just being rubbed in your face. Hey, here, here are the guys who, who just bombed your city and caused you so much terror. Possibly looking more healthy than you do. Possibly having been fed more than you have you know i don't know i don't know particularly what the rationing situation was in this particular town how it was going and what there was to buy on the black market i don't know it doesn't matter but you know maybe they're seeing because i mean american air crew would have been healthy fed well on an air base they were young vital you know apple apple right. cheeks kind of thing and perhaps that there was some resentment there as well of how look at look at our thought you've got these guys being treated better than we are you know i don't know right. But it doesn't it doesn't fall into our nice our convenient box of separating Nazis and good Germans. That's how we come have come to understand it more recently. When any documentary talks about the Holocaust, whatever, the presenter, the host makes it that clarification of the organization of the Nazis in the Third Reich and, and the Heydrichs and the and the Mengele's and the Himmlers and the fact that they were ordinary German folk who were victims of the Third Reich. And of course that that remains true, that basic principle. Right. And yet this muddies the water a little bit in the middle, doesn't it? It puts it that question about what ordinary people are capable of, as you just said a minute ago, in a, in a, in a weird situation where there's a coming together of timing and bad luck and experience of the bombing and, and some kind of pent-up anger and, and then mob, mob mentality. I presumably someone... I guess, through the first punch, through the first kick, and then a second and a third, then suddenly it's just frenzy, as you said, and and not just for a few minutes. This this was hours and people taking kind of breaks, as you say, to get there, to to, to get energy again, to go back into the kicking. It's it's an uncomfortable read, that part of your book. 
but in a good way you know yeah. it, it, it it provokes that response so and the length of the the length of the attack is, is part of what i think is so disturbing uh you know if this had been a spontaneous 10 15 minute outburst and you know people just lost control of themselves and 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 then they came to their senses you know that would be different but an entire an entire village you know spending two hours beating these people uh, that's that's a long time that's it's, that's it's a sustained yeah. act of brutality it's not it, it it's not over in a minute you know in as human beings you know we all get angry occasionally but in my case my anger subsides really really quickly and often i end up laughing because i can't yeah. keep it going long enough but i don't get angry very often i'm a very nice person i like to think but you know this sustained anger is fascinating but let's we'll leapfrog in a, let's move forward because you know you started right at the beginning, beginning about your 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 find discovering this story is the first war crime so let's we'll go back and show photos of some of the crew later on but at what at what point did the Amer the Allied authorities discover this story, and at what point did they? Th why did they decide to go about this war crime in particular? Because at the end of the war, there are lots and lots of war crimes to investigate of, of all sorts of right. scales. So, run us through some of the kind of reasoning for that. Yeah, they um, they had they established uh, the War Department established a division to investigate war crimes um, right at the end of the war, and like you said, they had plenty to work with. Um, but they started looking at these particular reports, and this one caught their eye because of the unusual nature of what we were just talking about—the fact that these were civilians, and so many of them, and and the 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 depth of uh, what they did. And so they sent uh, investigators to Ruschelheim to look into it. And when they started talking to people and, and uncovering some of the evidence, um, they were shocked at the, the depravity of the attack, um, that all the stuff we were just talking about. Um, but they were also very surprised that there was so much evidence to work with. Um, and, and so many people witnesses and potential defendants who were still in Ruschelheim. Um, that was one of the, the most influential decisions for them because um, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, the people involved in, in some of these atrocities had, had fled and it would, you know, it would be a big deal to track them down. In this case, they went to Ruschelheim and these people were still there for the most part. Um, so they had a lot to work with and they, they wanted to make this an example, make, make it a real uh, proving point for the fact that the, the, the allies, the Western world, would not accept this treatment of POWs. Um, and uh, so they decided to prosecute it and make it the first war crimes trial, which I, I, I think that sends a big message about what they thought of uh, what happened in Russia time. And I guess there's lots of things going on with this well because we've talked about it on shows before that at the end of the war everybody wants to go home if you're an allied serviceman in europe you want to go back home you've been away for x number of years you want to go back home um so holding on to key staff holding on to people when there's now this war crimes there's now this bureaucracy to do get set, set up so i suppose uh, in addition to prosecuting truly some truly evil people who did an evil thing there's also the sense of perhaps getting a quick case an open and sharp case as you say all, all the perpetrators are there in the same place it's not like right. like we had guy walters on a few weeks ago in the great escape a week talking about the the, the reprisals after the the, the murder 50 murdered after standard graffiti but there's poles and czechs and germans some have been killed in the war some are being held by the russians hundreds of miles away and it was really difficult in those first few in fact months to build a case because of the scattering of the perpetrators so in this case right. They're kind of all in one place, so perhaps they have this thing that we can get we can get through this case really quickly, you know, wham bam in the sense I'm borrowing the name of the aircraft, close close the case, boom, sentence, and make that statement to the world that we, as you said, we will not put up with this, but also that due process will 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 work efficiently because we now know that the war crimes process. I think it's fair to say didn't universally work very efficiently. Um, 
and took years and by the end by 40 years, the last war crimes everybody's lost interest half the germans have been in, and so i can see this propaganda reason of getting that case boom in and and high profile well the, you know, one of the prosecutors ended up you know becoming quite a famous guy post-war and so they, yeah. they kind of put all into this so so this the the the, the key the key guy is this air raid warden this this kind of bureaucrat guy um, but we'll run us through a little bit about the details of the trial, how many people were kind of brought to, and, and also before we do that, what, when they started interviewing these people, did they all immediately come clean quickly or was there lots of denial at the beginning? Was it a case of when you break one, they all, they all tumble like a, like a stack of cards? Yeah, they brought in uh, Lieutenant Colonel Leon Jaworski, who would later become the special prosecutor for Watergate. And um, he was, uh, once he was briefed on all of this, and he, he was determined to, he said he wanted to prosecute this case with the utmost vigor um, because of the, the, the nature of the case. And he also was uh, determined to show that the, the post-World War II would not be like the war crimes prosecutions after World War I, um, which were, as you were saying, they were drawn out. They were, uh, the, nothing really came of many of them. I think there were 12 people prosecuted. Only nine of them went to, actually went to trial. There weren't any real, real convictions to speak of. And he wanted, he wanted the prosecutions after World War II to be very different. So he thought this was a, a, a good case for that. Um, so once they came in, the uh, you know the investigative team came in and 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 started uh, gathering all the evidence, uh, both physical evidence and rounding up all the uh, uh, suspects and 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 witnesses and started gathering a lot of uh, testimony. Um, Jaworski said that he found that with these these Germans that it was uh, often more productive to just ask them to write down what they did. Uh, rather than subject them to some sort of uh, vigorous uh, interrogation. Um, because he said people would often uh, ad admit to much of what you were accusing them of. Uh, they, they, they may try to backpedal on some of their intentions and, and how much of something they did. But he found that a lot of people were not really denying their participation. And then you had a lot of people who were pointing fingers at each other too. Um, Harkin was put on trial. There was uh, a, another man named Wust who was pretty influential. Um, and they, I forget how many uh, people they put on trial altogether. I, was it maybe 21? I think they-, they Some of that, yeah. Over 20, a, a couple of the trial, the, the cases got dropped and then they added, it, 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 the number kind of enlarged and subtracted as they kind of processed in, in, in what you'd expect in that environment of, of yeah. evidence. and. Uh, and again, and weirdly, I'm interrupting now because we, the, an, another recurring theme this week has been the, the 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 Nazis recording their their atrocities with their own. In this case, the opposite's happening in that there is a lot of archival footage about this. I've, I put the links, folks, in the description below. It's it's silent for this about five minute clip below. You can find on YouTube YouTube of the of the court case. There's the you know, highlight to the trial, and there's also a, a a link to the 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 hanging of of one of the men. It doesn't actually name. It doesn't. Get, it wasn't easy to find on YouTube because the 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 name of the of uh, isn't in the title. It just says a German hanging in 1945, but it is there. So you can check those links out later, folks. But the fact that they're recording this, this. This is a statement case, isn't it? Which, which ironically, yeah. paradoxically, is what the Watergate case becomes thirty years later. It's the example, yeah. isn't it? It's a, you know, the government can only go so far. We'll get you eventually. So it's incredible. There's this connection between the symbolism of this case beyond its own actual um, pursuit of justice. There's a there's a symbolic nature to it as well of of sending Wars a message. Yeah, Sawarski was pretty pretty upfront about all of that. He he he. He said, "Yeah, this is a statement case. We are, you know, beyond the the prosecution of each individual. We are making a statement with this case about how we view this kind of wartime atrocity." Um, but at the same time, he insisted that these uh, defendants get a, a scrupulously fair trial, um, and there's really no allegation that they did not. Um, the there were lots of uh, courtroom testimony with uh, the people of Bruchelheim testifying um, against each other. Um, 
you know, I, elderly grandmothers, you know, being accused of heinous things um, and not necessarily denying them. Um, and in the end, uh, they sentenced uh, seven men to hang. Um, I think it was uh, three more sentenced to hard labor. And I think only one person was acquitted. Um, and then um, there was some delay before the hangings, um, which some of the survivors or some of the, the uh, crewmen's families uh, were not happy about and eventually complained and got that sped up. And there's a little interesting side note about the hangman, John C. Woods, who is a, a interesting character in his own right. He, he's a, he was a, a master sergeant in the army from Texas um, who uh, ended up sort of specializing in hanging. And um, he was, uh, he was prolific. He, he got to do quite a number of hangings, including uh, several of the, uh, several of the, the war crimes uh, convictions uh, from Nuremberg and so on. But uh, he, he's an interesting character in his own right, because- no, I think he has his own Wikipedia page um, yeah. as, as, as an infamous hangman. So yeah, I mean, and again, the fact this footage is, exists is incredible because you know you can spend a lot of time on YouTube. There isn't really very much footage of the war crimes trials. There isn't very much. They they kind of they they cut. Of course, they covered the big guys. They covered the Goerings and the. But when you go further down the chain, there was so much going on. So many prosecutions across Germany and indeed other countries, all within the the era of displacement camps and 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 and, and hunger and rationing and refugees i mean all, all taking place in an environment when it was very complicated so um that that we'll, we'll go back and talk about some of the the, the, the crew the, the the people who were who were killed because you said you know the roger's widow because he was the pilot and 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 their family have there's quite a lot on the internet you can find out there about 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 roger's the pilot and he is the the absolute when you look at the photo he is the the stereotypical kind of broad-shouldered, square-jawed, um, handsome American aviator you think of of World War II. Um, and uh, it was covered by the press. This is a newspaper cutting of, of, of how the... So how, how would the, the, the families of these... Obviously, they'd have had initially telegrams saying your loved one is missing, and then sometime later on dead, and then sometime later on than that, you know, murdered. So in your disc in your investigation i mean you can you can't kind of give a blanket answer of all the families but what was that process like for those families to go through in the you know the stages of the news gradually getting worse and worse yeah it um it always started out with a telegram saying that uh their loved one had been reported missing in action and for these crewmen it went on like that with that uh, uncertainty for a long time because it wasn't until um this investigation started and the bodies were uncovered and, and identified that they realized what crew had been assaulted in Ruschelheim. In fact, they initially thought it was a Canadian air crew. Um, and it wasn't until they uncovered the bodies and were able to identify them that they were able to say, oh, this was this, this incident that we've been talking about involved the crew of, of the Wembam. And that was the point at which the families could receive the final notice that their loved one had actually been killed. Ironically, the the two surviving airmen, um, well, the three surviving airmen, uh, Bren Stuhl, Adams, and Brown, had gone home from the war without knowing what happened to the rest of the crew. And it wasn't until they read news accounts about the trial um, that they realized it was their crew they were talking about. And the, during the trial, they often referenced the other two missing airmen who were presumed dead. And uh, I think it was about three weeks after the trial concluded that Adams and Brown wrote a letter to Jaworski and said, I think you're talking about us and we're alive and well in, in America. Um, which actually brought great joy to Jaworski and his, mm. his team because it was the one bright moment from this really tragic story. Uh, they, of course, would have loved to have their testimony during the trial, but the, the convictions went In a, They didn't need it anyway. But, um, but again, that going back to this idea of the spontaneous nature of this attack is that it's interesting 
the, during the process, they, they, they don't even know who these people are. In that, when we talked about this the tragedy in Norway yesterday, this again was a reprisal against a known group of people who had been assisting English agents going back and forth to England and and harboring members of the Linga, the Norwegian resistance. So it's a the target was was specific. This this is just really a tragic case of wrong place, wrong time. In that they don't even care who it is they're attacking. It's a, they're attacking the symbol. They're attacking the symbol, I suppose, of terror bombing. And someone said in the sidebar earlier, I mean, we we need to acknowledge as well that at this point in the war, Goebbels and his team are absolutely playing on on the terror flyer uh, aspect of it. It's all part of their, you know, they're they're getting across that these air crews. You know, machine gun women and children when they're, they're they're bringing their aircraft in, they they're targeting hospitals, they're targeting civilians, all these untruths that the Goebbels is using. So so he's he's he has he and his staff have sown the seeds for this. Add a bit of rationing that and, and a bit of hardship that sows the next level of seeds. And then the day after a raid, then there's these people coming down the street and. As we established, all this pent up frustration comes out. No, it's not, I'm not excusing it or forgiving it. I'm just trying to rationalize it. No, you're right, though. I mean, Goebbels had sort of dehumanized the Allied air crews and, and also, I, I guess, sort of de individualized them. You know, they, they, they so that they, they didn't, nobody looked at them and saw a 19 year old boy who had been, you know, just thrust into this machine of war. They, they saw the, the, this, monolithic air crew that they had been told is just out to kill your babies and, and destroy your, your home. Um, and I, I guess that's part of what triggers that sort of mentality that, uh, that, that they're not human and, um, and you can do these terrible things to them. And, and that leads me neatly to kind of how I want to move on now and bring the show to an end in that We've had discussions before, and there are other discussions about you know the fire bombing of Dresden and the bomber Harris, and there's that Malcolm Gladwell's new book out now about the bomber mafia that's doing the rounds. That, by all accounts of my historic, historian friends, is terrible, but it's getting lots of attention. Um, and this, it's this this idea that the bomber force is some kind of sentient being. It's it's a, it's like a Star Wars fleet of nameless crews, and and people in Germany. You know, I've got friends in Germany. That, there's still this this when the bombers are bomber bombing is discussed it's discussed at this high level no pun intended of high level aperture but and of, of a force but the, the the happy ending to this story is what's happened in the town because there is now a monument there these flyers are recognized with a monument in the same street where this terrible beating look took place so right. I, I think that's a really positive way because it's a, it's a massive great monument there there are their eight faces there the eight murder victims there on this monument and and for the folks watching they incorporated bricks from the original wall as the backing of the monument there so there's it's a black and white photo this way it's all i could find but the black and white the, the, the bricks there are from this original wall and there's an information that was up 2004 i think the wall was or 2002 2004 i think um, so, you know, what's your feeling, uh, Gregory, about about the symbolism today for the people of Germany? I mean, I, do you, are you are you in, in agreement with me that it's a, it's good that that town now has a means of identifying the the, the air force by by kind of by uh, by name by by looking at the faces of these young people? Yeah, I think that's what makes that monument so good that, because it it points out that these these were individual human beings. Uh, these these were real young men with real lives and you know looking at that picture you there's no way to know those those aren't you know young men from Ruschelheim. Um, yeah so it just i think it, it it brings the 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 human nature back to it all which is what was lacking on the street that day yeah exactly and and, and you can i think it would be perfectly fine to be a german person today and 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 not to be happy about the fact that german cities be bombed perhaps that's okay you're entitled to that opinion but you can also still respect the fact that 21 year old air crews were just doing their job just like everybody was doing their job and and it was you know they didn't decide the targets these crews they didn't they, they were called up most of them they were drafted sent overseas and given a job and you could be right. swabbing the, the decks on a battleship you could be you know peeling potatoes in a camp in nebraska or you could be on a, in a crew of a b-24 flying over germany you were just doing your bit uh, as part of a greater source so i think that's the, the, the kind of a happy ending 
in a sense that there's a there's a message there to the to the people of Germany that there's a there's a human aspect to this story that must always be considered and the, and, and the monument and there's also another monument now folks in in Georgia in the air, in the Air Force Museum there there's a plaque to the the whole crew including those who survived and made it back um, and there's the same photo there a part of the crew there and recently I think it was 2017 or something. Um, there's a there's now a street in the Bronx in New York over one of the, you know John uh, N Sakul there so um, he has a um, uh, his recognition there and and maybe other pilots other members of the crew will have their own recognition in where the towns they came from or something like that so the story lives and of course we have to um, thank you for your book because your book has now immortalize this in a way that other people find I suppose this show as well will help out um, so you know. When you're in your various books, obviously you, you, you want to tell a good story. You want to you want to grip people, and you've, you're you're known for having that kind of page-turning thriller aspect to your book. But you also must, as, as all my guests, have a kind of a deeper hope for the book. And I guess it's to do. You said earlier it's to honor the crew. But you know what would be what do what do you want people to take away when they've read your book? Perhaps they're reading it and they're not a history buff like my viewers are. What's your takeaway you'd like to have? Yeah, you know, um, a lot of my readers are, are not like really deep historians or, or, or real war buffs or anything. Um, but I think what draws them to some of my stories um, is, is the fact that they all center on these kind of personal tales, um, which is which it, 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 what I, I always find the most meaningful when I start looking into these stories. Um, it's the individual tales of these these young men who were caught in terrible situations and you know how they how they suffered how they rose to the occasion how it affected their families and um, you know the whole the whole thing that that we've been talking about today about how you may have a, a massive war going on but it all comes down to individual stories it's all it's all a, a, a compilation of individual people going through an experience and that's what I that's what I like to explain. Yeah, and I think you know we we all pause and think uh, about the those eight lives and how awful their last few hours were. You know, being beaten up in a street for doing your job. I mean, there's no way of dying in World War Two is a good way of dying. Although I suppose if I was going to choose it, I'd choose a nice quick death from a but a, a you know bullet or something. But you know, this is a horrible, horrible way to go for just doing your duty. And and it and it does, as we said at the beginning remind people that bomber missions are not about them well they are about them the number of aircraft is important on an operational level there is the 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 effect on the war effort how did it damage german industry did it damage german industry did it reduce their means to produce aircraft parts or the opal factory in that case which is the, the ref raid vehicles right uh, for the armaments industry to, to help further the war effort that's the that's the bit that the students of aviation look at and they weigh it all up and say this raid did this this raid did this and they can discuss the merits or otherwise of it but this is just about young men being beaten to death in a street by ordinary people including old ladies it it, it world war ii stories don't get more basic than that and at the same time they don't get more harrowing and emotional than that true yeah. true so well it's been amazing talking to you gregory and um i hope you delve into well, well where you can come on again and talk about another book hopefully in, in a couple weeks time yeah. about the, um, the last 500 and you know another story for another day but you know this i think people have been i, I can tell by the sidebar sometimes because i watch it I, I i'm always doing multiple things i'm advancing the slides thinking of the questions looking at the time and checking the sidebar and sometimes the conversation goes very technical and they go off on other branches about the marks of spitfire or something and that's great i like that sometimes they're quite quiet and i think when they're quiet it often means they're just taking it in they're just they're just everybody's just sitting thinking and going oh my god how would i how would i like to spend the last few hours of my life being beaten up by someone it's that that's the i like the fact that the shows i do provoke slightly different reactions at different occasions because of the the, the 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 nature of the, the discussions we're having so it's some um, important that people stop and consider so um brilliant well um it's been great and talk, great talking to you. i'll just remind my viewers we were coming up and i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so so folks that will have brought tragedies and disasters week to an end 
Although, as someone pointed out earlier, pretty much every story we tell in World War II has a tragic element because it is war, and war is in, ultimately about death and suffering, uh, and then hopefully a, a vanquishing of an, of an evil enemy, which was the case in World War II. So um, next week, so starting on Monday, it's South Asia history and Southeast Asia history. So we've got some great shows coming. Watch the times, folks, because I'm dealing with time difference people in India. So KS Nair is coming on a Monday talking about the Indian Air Force. Um, we've got shows about uh, South Asian heroes in World War II, shows about um, the, the uh, famous Operation Jaywick, the raid into Singapore with a renowned Australian ex historian. I'm looking forward to that one. Indian Navy show, which I haven't put on YouTube yet, but I will do soon. So lots of stuff coming up. As usual, check us out on Patreon. Check us out on social media. The link to Gregory's website is in the description below. There's a link to how you can buy the book. It's definitely worth getting. As some of you have already said you ordered it, so great that that, that the royalties will, 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 will make Gregory smile, I hope, so that's good. Uh, but in, right now, it, uh, it's my duty to say thank you very much, Gregory Freeman, for joining us. And did you enjoy it? It was wonderful, yeah. Thank you for the experience. No, it's been good. So, um, well, that's it then, folks. Enjoy your weekend. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying thank you very much for taking your time to spend your uh, evenings with us or your afternoons or your mornings, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, well, we will see you all again next week. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your weekend.